Hey, so we're so glad that you're checking out this video and our prayer is that it helps those who are far from God become committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, what we don't want is for this video to be a replacement for church. It can't be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering of believers in covenant community with other believers at the local church matters. And what's more is that God designed us to be in community with one another. That said, if you're in the North Georgia area and you don't have a church you call home, we'd love to have you come and visit Brainerd, North Georgia. I'm praying that this message serves as a blessing to you, that it helps you, encourages you, and even challenges you, all the while bringing you closer to Jesus. So again, super excited that you're checking out this video. Just don't treat this video as a replacement for church, and I think that the Lord will honor that and see your commitment to the local church. Second Peter, as Debbie mentioned, is where we're going to be at, and uh, if you're visiting with us for the first time today, we've been slowly walking through the book of Second Peter, and so each week we've been walking through this book, and uh, we're hoping to conclude this book in the next few weeks. But that's where we'll be at, and that's what we're covering for today. Uh, before we jump in, um, I was talking to my dad uh, the other day, and um, he was telling me a story uh, about a phone call that he had. And uh, if you guys know, like my, my parents moved up uh, about a year and a half ago um, from Miami, Florida. They've lived in Miami almost all their life after they defected from living in Cuba uh, for several years. And so Miami's home for them in a lot of ways. And uh, they came up here uh, to Ringgold and to Chattanooga for one reason and one reason alone. And it wasn't me. It was my girls. <laughs> That's why they came up, because they love those babies, and uh, they want to make sure that they can have their time to be able to spend with them, of which I love, you know. So sometimes I'll get some love here and there, but that's all right. Um, I'm just messing. They're in here in the room, so I can kind of jest a little bit. But needless to say, my dad still has coworkers that he loves and people and friends that he has and family that are still down in Miami. And so uh, recently he got a few phone calls, and they all had 305 numbers. And that 305 is the zip code or the area code um, for Miami. And uh, my dad didn't get a chance to see it, but he was willing to call back uh, just to see because, you know, again, there's, they've just moved up here, and so they're trying to make sure that they cover bases and blah, blah, blah. So my dad calls back, and sure enough, uh, that person picks up the phone, and uh, my dad hears the person and immediately say, oh, thank you for calling us back. We would love to lower your interest rates for your credit card. My dad's like... <laughs> right? And so sure enough, that day my dad was in a peppy mood. So he's like, all right, I'll stay on the phone. <laughs> so he's like, all right. And he's like, man, thank you for calling. I would love to lower my interest rate. He's like, fantastic, sir. I just need one thing from you and we can make this happen. He goes, okay, what's that? Your credit card number. I was like, really? Okay. Well, that's great. I can give that to you, right? And so sure enough, the guy's like, okay, well, great. And my dad's like, are you ready? And he's like, I'm ready. All right, I'm going to give you the number. Okay, go ahead, sir. I'm ready. All right, here we go. 555, uh-huh, 55, uh-huh, 5555. <laughs> and then sure enough, right afterwards, man, the amount of expletives that came out of that line were a bunch, and then he just clicked the phone. And mind you, at that very moment, I think all of us would understand and know that when that person said those words, man, I would love to lower your interest rate for your credit card, all of our flags go straight up, right? And we're like, nope, and our attentiveness, we're on guard, we're on the defense. Why? Because the last thing that we want is the person on the other line to swindle us or to exploit us from our money. That's not what we want. We want to walk away from that. In fact, thankfully now, we at least get in the caller ID scam alert, you know, so that we don't even have to answer that. And I promise you, if I hear another extension of my car's warranty, I'm going to throw my phone out the window. I, guess, I mean, it's, it's all the time, right? And so my dad knew immediately that somebody on the other line wanted to do one thing and one thing alone, and that was to take something that belonged from him, right? Now listen to me. If we would do that with a phone call and we would be on guard, wouldn't it be true that we would do the exact same thing when it comes to the truth of the gospel? We need to be on guard 
any time all of a sudden there is a gospel that isn't rooted in Scripture, that doesn't have the substance that it's supposed to have, that immediately all of our flags should go up and we should be on guard for anything that would move us away from the gospel that called us and from the gospel that we hold true. Peter here says the very same thing to all of us as he said then. He goes, here are some people that want to do nothing more than to take from you, to move you away from what you first believed. In fact, if there was a singular point that Peter was making then, that he's still making today, it would be the following. We, that's you and us, all of us in this room, must be on guard for false teachers who seek to lead us away from the gospel. And as it was prevalent then, guys, it's prevalent today. And so it begs the question for all of us, why should we be on guard, Paul? Well, the the main idea gives you the reason, but then Peter gives for us three specific reasons from this text to help us answer the question, why should we be on guard? We should be on guard because, one, false teachers are a constant. That's going to be the case until Jesus comes back. Secondly, we should be on guard because false teachers have a reputation. And so Peter gives us a profile, so to speak, for what to look out for. And then lastly, we should be on guard because false teachers have a desire to mislead. This is the part where it truly becomes Sad because we see the end goal in mind for all of the false teachers. And that is what they want more than anything else is to lead you into sin and to keep you in sin. It's truly sad, but we'll get to that point here in just a few moments. Let's begin with this very first reason why we should be on guard, and that is because false teachers are a constant. Notice what verse 1 says once again, as Debbie read for all of us. It says, there were indeed false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Peter here begins by reminding the church that false teachers aren't something new. In fact, they're as old as Moses. This has been prevalent since that time. It was relevant in Jesus' day. And Peter here also reminds the church that it's still an issue. It's still a problem. Nothing has changed. In fact, listen to what Moses warned the people of God as he wrote to them in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. It says, If a prophet or someone who has dreams arises among you and proclaims a sign or wonder to you, and that sign or wonder he has promised you comes about, but he says, listen, let's follow other gods which you have not known. And let's worship them. Do not listen to that prophet's words or to that dreamer. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. So even then in that day, Moses says, be careful who you listen to and where they lead you to. Jesus himself warned in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, when he said, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise and perform great signs and wonders to lead you astray, if possible, even the elect. So Jesus himself says, there'll be some that will falsely represent who I am, claim a title that they don't rightfully have, and even sway people that are the elect, Christians. Now, did you notice the pattern that Peter presents, that Jesus presented, and that even Moses presented. In every one of those warnings, from all of them, all of these false teachers didn't come from the outside. They came from where? From the inside, right? So here, the messiahs, the prophets, the teachers... These people are using those particular titles to infiltrate the church. And in doing so, there's this important distinction that we should see. Rather than the outside, it's in the inside. Because I truly believe that this is one of Satan's greatest tactics. 
attack the church from the inside with shepherds dressed like sheep who are actually wolves. All of them would never deny that they know Jesus, that they say good things about Jesus, but there is still a subtle deceivement within their lives that if, if you don't catch it, that's how all of a sudden someone can get swayed into believing that they have the greatest intentions when the truth is they do not. First and foremost, Peter here, just by simply pointing to the past and looking at the present while also peering to the future, gives us our very first warning as to why we should be on guard. The reason is because false teachers are going to be a constant until Jesus returns. And so you and I can even look at our current situation, our current timeline, of where we live in our culture, Christianity. Don't you find it surprising that every once in a while you have one of these false teachers that prop up in the Christian world, whether they're prosperity gospel teachers or not, and people follow this individual? They fall, and then it's as if years later someone else rises up, and there they go again. Again, the first warning that we have here is to be on guard. Why? Because it's a reality. It's a constant. Secondly, Peter goes on to give the profile of these false teachers so that we would rightfully be on guard for how they act and how they live. And here Peter exposes these false teachers for the reputation that they actually have. Listen again to what verse 1, 2, and 3 says about them. See if you can catch the specific profile that Peter gives in these verses. And I'll, along the way, I'll tell you, hey, mark this word, circle this word, because it'll be important. No, notice again in verse 1, the latter portion of it, they will bring in, circle it, destructive heresies, even circle it, denying the master who brought them and will bring swift destruction on themselves. Verse 2, many will follow their depraved ways. You can circle that. And the way of truth will be maligned because of them. Here's an important one. Verse 3, they will circle it, exploit you in their greed with made-up stories. Did you catch all the different descriptions that Peter here gives about the kind of reputation that these false teachers have. There are two main, I think, descriptions, if you had to kind of bundle them up together, that Peter says this is how you can identify a false teacher. First of all, they have destructive heresies, and then secondly, they have a way of exploiting you as a believer. Okay, first of all, you see how they have destructive heresies. Now, first let's define what that word means because I think we need, to be, we need to make a right distinction of what a heresy is and what a heresy is not. Okay, I love what Albert Moeller says as he defines what a heresy is. Listen to these words by Dr. Moeller. He says, heresy is a denial or deviation from a, doctrinal, from a doctrine central and essential to Christianity. Let me say that one more time. Heresy is a denial or deviation from a doctrine central and essential to Christianity. I got you, Paul. Help me. What exactly are you talking about? Well, let's say, for example, that if someone were, someone were to deny the divinity of Jesus and say that he is not God, that's heresy. If somebody were to say that the atonement isn't necessary for our salvation, that's heresy. That the resurrection is nothing but a hoax, that's a heresy. Okay? It's important to make that distinction because if not, we've got to be careful. Sometimes, and, and there's some Christians out there that they'll, they'll, they won't know what a heresy is and then it's a license to call anything and everything a heresy, right? So there'll be some people out there, they'll, walk, they'll go be driving down. Cloud Springs Road, that church doesn't believe in John Calvin, heresy, right? They don't believe in all different kinds of translations, heresy, right? Man, they believe that, they, that the Baptist hymnal should be part of the Bible, heresy. You know, it's, it's a joke. Um, I love the Baptist hymnal, please. Maybe that is heresy, but 
But needless to say, you get what I'm saying, right? Not everything is heresy. So what that means is, guys, there are doctrinal differences that you and I may have that aren't heresy. If you believe in a pre-trib and somebody next to you believes in a post-trib, they're not a heretic, okay? If some of you are convinced that Adam had a belly button and you don't, they're not a heretic, okay? So here's the thing. We need to make careful distinctions so that we don't cry wolf for something that isn't. But when we need to say what is rightfully wrong, then we'll have the chips to be able to say this is wrong. Okay. Now, you may wonder, well, Paul, what's the heresy that's found here in this text? Because Peter must be alluding to something. The heresy that these false teachers were claiming is the following. That you can claim Jesus with your lips, but you can deny him with your life. Listen to me. That you can claim Jesus with your lips, but you can deny him with your life. How do I know that? Read carefully verse 1. It says, they will bring in destructive heresies. Listen, even denying the master who bought them. So here are people who Jesus would have rightfully described as those whom the seed of the gospel perhaps landed on rocky soil, but yet never sprouted for actual gospel transformation. What's more, the heresy there that they're proclaiming is that I am okay with abusing the grace of God as a license for immorality, and then to take it a step further, I am going to claim to everyone that Jesus has no authority upon my life. That's what it means to deny Jesus as your master. When Scripture declares to you and to me that Jesus is in fact king. In other words, here's another way to think about it. These are guys that love the fire insurance but don't want Jesus to govern their lives. They pay lip service to Jesus but deny him by the way that they live. If you read past these verses, you will see their rampant immorality that they are engaged in. And what's, what's similar to what we covered last week in the book of Jude is the fact that these guys not only are publicly living out a life of immorality, but they want the rest of the people to join in in what they are doing. That's the heresy. The heresy is God and the gospel are intended to transform you, not to just simply give you fire insurance. That's not how it works. As I've often said before, the point of the gospel is not that you get heaven. The point of the gospel is that you get God. And in getting God, you get transformation. They didn't want anything to do with that. On the one hand, they had this kind of theology being preached by their lives. So that was one of the destructive heresies. Secondly, the other thing that they were doing is that they were exploiting believers. Verse 3 attests to this. Notice what it says. They will. I mean, Peter here is speaking with authoritative language to say this is what they will in fact do to you. They will exploit you in their greed with made-up stories. Similar to the phone call that my dad made where they tried to take advantage of my father by taking his information, that's the same thing that these false teachers are wanting to do. Take advantage of young believers who aren't grounded properly in the word of God, which means you need to know the word of God. This is why it's so important so that no one can trick you or swindle you into something that isn't true. That's why your daily reading of God's word or being under faithful preaching is essential to your spiritual health. If not, listen to the words of Peter. That's what they'll do. Now, here what you unveil is what some of the biggest temptations that come across for pastors actually are. In fact, two of them are evident here in this text. 
One of the temptations is the abuse of power because of their positions. These are false teachers. They're leaders within the church. Secondly, these are pastors who are chasing platforms in order to create a persona so that it benefits themselves rather than serving the church. So here they are saying, I am a man of the cloth, and I'm going to do all that I can to see you as my opportunity for my own gain. And here the gain is financial. That's what most commentators agree upon. And so Peter brings out these temptations here in verse 3 for our warning. He describes these false teachers by their exploitation. In other words, these men use their power for the sake of swindling other believers and the one thing that they are interested and the only thing alone that they're interested in is money. That's what they want. And you're target number one. The saddest part I think about these kinds of individuals or those who have ministries that desire to do that towards believers is duping believers or themselves into thinking that gifts are far much more satisfying than God when that is not the case. Or as John Piper once said, these are teachers who elevate the gift above the giver. That's what they want. It makes the gift far much more important than God, and that's not the real gospel. That's prosperity gospel. And in fact, it's not even true worship of God. All that it's being revealed is their idolatry of their true God, which is money. It is really sad to be able to see those kinds of things taking place and using Christianity as its guise of goodness, of grace, of righteousness when it couldn't be further from the truth. Now, you may be wondering, okay, well, Paul, how else can you really give a spotlight to some of this prosperity gospel or other things that it can be harmful to the church? I think the two of the most harmful that I've seen is legalism and prosperity gospel. Legalism is the notion or the idea that the Bible doesn't go far enough, so you have to add rules to it in order for you to be right before God. Or it's the idea that you can use your own ability or works in order to gain salvation, and that is not the case. We believe what the Bible teaches, that salvation comes through grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. That's the gospel, right? But I have often found John Piper to be a great resource for my heart and soul in highlighting certain characteristics of what prosperity gospel looks like or individuals that continue to perpetuate prosperity gospel. What are some, some flags that I should look for? John Piper here lists, lists six. I'm not going to go overboard on this, but just listen to this. It's interesting, first of all, that often they have no robust doctrine for suffering. It's always give me what is good and what is happy and what is exciting in life. But yet the reality is we live in a Genesis 3 kind of world where there's hurt, there's pain, there's suffering, there's evil. But yet seldom is that ever talked about when it comes to prosperity gospel preaching. It's tell me more about what I can get from God. Nothing about suffering. Secondly, there's no clear call to deny yourself, but rather it's all about yourself. There's no gospel call to say deny yourself and give your life to Jesus. It's none of those things. Thirdly, there's no real serious exposition that you find. Very often, it's pet peeve subjects that get lifted out of Scripture with no context and no actual intended meaning for what the scripture is actually saying. And it's just, just, just jumping through verses all over the place just to, just to teach what they want to teach, not what God is teaching. You know, another way of thinking about it is every week, guys, my heart is to let the, the word of God set the agenda of the day. Not me. This sets the agenda. 
And my heart is to faithfully proclaim that and to show you my homework that the agenda matches what God's Word says. If it doesn't, throw something at me. Be like, what are you doing? We like exposition. We don't like all this other stuff, right? Fourthly, there's no real wrestling with tensions. So over time, you know what ends up happening? One portion of Scripture doesn't align with the other portion of Scripture, and then all of a sudden there's a tension. Well, why doesn't this work this way? I thought you said this, and now it's this. That happens when you don't preach the whole counsel of God's Word. You only get subject matters, and you get snippets of what Scripture actually teaches. But there's no wrestling with any tensions within Scripture. Fifth, it's very interesting, just as Peter brings out here, that there's this exuberant lifestyle. Their money is worn on themselves with fancy clothes or fancy cars or fancy planes. And you begin to kind of scratch your head, what's going on here? It seems like there's a pattern. It doesn't mean that we can't have nice things, but that's not the ultimate goal. Here, the pattern seems to always be that the preacher is more in love with money than it is with the glory of God. And that's a flag. Lastly, is that there's way too much conversation about self, which means that often the conversation is about making you the center of the gospel and not Jesus the center of the gospel. Those are the six other characteristics that you can think through when it comes to how can I spot something that is false and also a false teacher. Now, did, did you notice that that's within the church and there are churches that will have Easter services, Christmas services, that will talk about Jesus being God and everything else. But don't you find it interesting, as I mentioned earlier, that in the midst of their exploitation of other believers, you begin to see how it's just lip service and nothing impacts their actual life. It's dangerous. There is a spot of goodness, however, that we can know. Thankfully, we had one that didn't come to exploit you. We had one that came to sacrifice his life for you. Jesus wasn't a high flyer. He was broke. He didn't have much. All that he had that he owned was ripped from him from the cross. Jesus here gives a beautiful picture of his raw intentions. He came to seek and to save the lost. There's no hidden agenda with Jesus. It's nothing. There's no closets back there. What's he hiding? Who's he exploiting? None of that. Jesus came with one purpose and one purpose alone, to show you truth and to save your life. That is a teacher worth following. And if there isn't a pastor that's following that teacher, then that's a problem. That is the model, church. Jesus is the model of the true teacher. In fact, if you ever wanted to look at what humility and divinity looks like, go to Philippians chapter 2 and read the beautiful Christology that's there and you will see humility and divinity just shown in an absolute stunning way for all of us to say that's the example for all of us. So church, be on guard. Why? Because there are false teachers who have a reputation and that reputation precedes them. Thirdly, this is their end goal is that false teachers have a desire to mislead. This is, this is frankly one of the saddest portions that's here in this text. Notice what verse 2 says. Many will follow, not a few, not a little, many. Many will follow. Follow what? Their depraved ways. And the truth will be maligned because of them. Let me give you the skinny on what's going on here. I find it interesting, as I mentioned earlier, that these teachers have that one primary heresy, that they deny the authority of Jesus within their life. Listen to me, when you do that, when you can make Jesus something that he's not, then you will excuse the desires that you want. That's what they're doing. And so don't you find it interesting that these false teachers want nothing more than to have you join in on the very same lifestyle that they're living in? 
And what do they want to do? They want to, they want to somehow or another sway you into that kind of lifestyle so that it justifies theirs and so that you can justify the very same sin that they may be in. The sin that they were in was rampant immorality, was sexual in nature. And that was what they wanted other people to join in with them. If you read through the rest of chapter 2, it's there. And the saddest part about it is that people get duped into that and all that they will find out is that all that they wanted was bad intentions for their lives. I mean, think about this. How many people have come to church in environments where there is the prosperity gospel or deep legalism and then they've left because of the hurt that has been caused in their life? And then they can't darken the, the doors of another church. Why? To get hurt again? To get duped again? To see another form of pastoral malpractice all over again? That's what the rest of verse 2 talks about. Because of their life, because of other people going into that, what does it do? It damages the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it means by maligning the truth. And so here there's a subtle warning. One, be careful, church, who is influencing your life, who you're constantly listening to. And secondly, know that there's more at stake than you may think. Your testimony, the testimony of the gospel is at stake. And so he says, be mindful of where they will lead you. Church, if there was two walking points that I want you to be reminded of, it would be the following. One, guys, be reminded of how important it is for you to be rooted in the Word of God. You need to know this book. You need to know it. It's that essential within your life. Because if not, if you're not careful, there will be lies that will lead you astray. And so you need to know this book. Secondly, you need to make sure that those who are influencing you influence you because they use this book as a means of loving you. Preaching should be an act of love and service towards the church, not a means of exploitation. It's someone who leads you towards godliness, not away from it. That's, that's the means of what you should look for for your spiritual health from someone who's teaching the word of God. Furthermore, because I know that there are some, even within here, that are called to ministry and have a love for ministry. It's a, it's a big reminder for all of us, myself included, of what Paul told Timothy. Paul told Timothy not to compromise the word, not to coddle the word, or even be more congenial with the word. Paul told Timothy, preach the word, which means have a fervent desire to say the truth of God's word matters. And I want to be faithful to what the word says. If not, we will compromise what God has called us as pastors and you who are seeking to be in vocational ministry to compromise. Preach the word and see its faithfulness work in the lives of people and to know to know that the word of God is enough to change the hearts and lives of people. It's what they need. Not codgling, not congenial, not any of those things. The word. And so church, do you know why we need to make sure that we know the things that we do even for today? It's because we must be on guard for false teachers who seek to lead us away from the gospel. Be 